Hello, welcome back to Dinosaurs. Today we're going to talk about uh, dinosaurs. So we've been spending a lot of time talking about the other stuff that was around during the Mesozoic or just before the Mesozoic or in the Paleozoic uh, on the way to the age of the dinosaurs. Uh, we're now here, we're going to start talking about dinosaurs and we're going to talk dinosaurs every day for the rest of the course. So I uh, hope you're ready for some dinosaurs. So we're going to start with dinosaur classification and like how we group the dinosaurs, kind of the dino family tree. And then we're going to kind of talk about some of the ways that we actually analyze the fossil record and try to reconstruct the way dinosaurs were when they were alive and how they behaved and how they interacted with each other. And that's going to be the end of module two. Uh, let's get into it. But before we do that, some announcements. <laughs> OK. All right, so let's review. Uh, so we, last time we talked about the not dinosaurs, the things that were around during the Mesozoic uh, besides dinosaurs. So true, false, dinosaurs were the only important organisms during the Mesozoic. What do you think? So were dinosaurs the only important thing that was around during the Mesozoic? You'll see a lot of paleo art reconstructing the Mesozoic, and you'll see a lot of dinosaurs. Not a dinosaur here, but uh, not, not a lot else. So is that true? Uh, it is false. There are a lot of other organisms around during the Mesozoic that are not dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are the dominant herbivores through the latter parts of the Mesozoic. Dinosaurs are the dominant carnivores. Dinosaurs fill a lot of the terrestrial niches. Uh, they don't fill any of the aquatic niches at all. They are not in the oceans. Uh, Spinosaur, uh, who is weirdly kind of pictured here, might have been semi-aquatic, but all the other dinosaurs are terrestrial. Dinosaurs are not in the sky. Uh, pterosaurs are not dinosaurs. So they're not filling any of those niches until towards the end when the sort of bird dinosaurs, the, um, the AVs, start evolving. Uh, so we'll talk about that too. Um, but there's a lot of other creatures around here. We talk about turtles, we talk about lizards, we talk about snakes, uh, amphibians, insects the plants themselves. There's a lot of other things around during the Mesozoic besides dinosaurs. Now, obviously, dinosaurs are very charismatic. They're very cool. They're very interesting. It's rightfully what people think about when they think about the Mesozoic, but they're not the only things there. It's a complex ecosystem, just like today's modern complex ecosystem. So what about grass? So true or false, grasses were an important part of the herbivorous dinosaur diet. So here's some art here. A dinosaur kind of walking around in a nice lush grassy field. Here's some grass here with Tyrannosaurus. Uh, word grass is an important part of your reverse diet. So uh, think about like uh, wildebeests, bison, moose, uh, large herbivorous mammals today. Grasses are very important staples in their diet. Uh, it was not so for the large herbivorous dinosaurs. Grasses were not evolved yet. Grasses did not evolve until after the Mesozoic was over. Uh, you'll often see in paleo art, uh, this is a very cool rendering of a Tyrannosaurus, even got the little feather crest, so it's relatively accurate, probably. Uh, we don't have any direct evidence for this, but there's probably at least some feathers. Uh, it's got the lips covering the teeth. It's a pretty good reconstruction of the dinosaur. Uh, a lot of times the backgrounds, and especially the plants, sort of uh, don't get paid attention to quite as much. Uh, in some cases, they'll even render like a modern scene and then just kind of paste their really fancy dinosaur art over it. Um, again, this is, it looks, it may not in fact be grass, but it sure looks like grass. Um, this is not true. Dinosaurs didn't have grass to munch on. So ferns sort of filled that role. Uh, might be one reason why there is not a lot of really small dinosaurs. There's mostly large-ish dinosaurs. Grass wasn't really an option. Um, so. Uh, let's talk about the amniocladogram again. We've seen this a bunch of times. Uh, the vertebrates, all animals with a backbone, and we are vertebrates. Tetrapods, animals with four limbs, we are tetrapods. Uh, we are amniotes. Us and dinosaurs are still the same up to this point. Uh, but then there's the synapsids with that single hole behind the eye, and the diapsids with the two holes behind the eye. That's all the modern lizards, modern snakes, modern reptiles and the archosaurs of which dinosaurs are a part. So this is that cladogram we walked up, uh, I think two classes ago, dinosaurs are at the top. Now remember that um, just because they're at the top, it doesn't mean they're better. It doesn't mean they're more advanced. 
It doesn't mean that they're, that evolution was slowly working towards the inevitability of dinosaurs. It's just the way we organize the tree. So like, for example, pterosaurs filled their niche just as well as dinosaurs filled their niche. In many ways, pterosaurs are cooler than dinosaurs. So the, the way on the position on the tree doesn't really matter in that way. Evolution is not progressive, it's not directional, uh, although it does only go one way and once you're extinct, you're gone forever, but it's not trying to evolve towards dinosaurs or trying to evolve towards humans. Uh, it just sort of happened that way. Uh, so uh, again, the diagnostic features, dinosaur versus reptile, uh, if you've been paying very close attention, uh, these things have sort of changed very subtly throughout the course. I've been updating this as I go along. I've been finding some exceptions. So, um, so again, hip structure is the main one. The hole in the hip socket is the main defining characteristic of dinosaurs in that 90 degree femur head to accommodate that upright stance. And the ankle structure, the first row of the ankle is fixed and that hinged joint rather than the sprawling joint like the Rawasukians and the Phytosaurs and the other, that archosaur line, the Pseudosuchian crocodilomorph line. Uh, the legs, the more elongated tibia, fibula versus the femur, so the large, long leg bones, longer metatarsal ankle bones. Uh, and then the sacral vertebrae, uh, three plus fused vertebrae at the hip, whereas most reptiles only have two. Uh, throughout the evolution of dinosaurs, it kind of becomes a kind of like more and more of them are fused, uh, but at least three, generally five, more than two. <clears throat> so this is not news to you. Hopefully you're uh, up to date on this. Hopefully this is uh, second nature by now. Uh, so just look at all of the different dinosaurs. So again, we've got Mesozoic dinosaurs. Mesozoic is divided into Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. Uh, and then once we get to the tertiary, that's the next uh, period and the dinosaurs go extinct here. So dinosaurs are living in these periods. Looking at the body forms in the Triassic, they're pretty similar to each other. Uh, they're also relatively small uh, until towards the end. Uh, and then at the end of the Triassic, there's that big late ex uh, mass extinction. So the Rawasukians go extinct, the Phytosaurs go extinct. A lot of the larger terrestrial animals of the time that were standing in the dinosaurs' way and kind of keeping them small and outcompeting them at the higher levels, uh, they get wiped out at the end of the Triassic. So again, why? Uh, maybe climate change. Maybe they were adapting better. Maybe they're reproducing more. We talked about that in that video for homework. So hopefully you saw that. Uh, then in the Jurassic, there's this massive explosion of dinosaur body forms dinosaur shapes, dinosaur sizes, dinosaur roles, and we get start getting these like truly massive sauropod dinosaurs. Uh, dinosaurs as we know them really started becoming a thing uh, in the Jurassic, and it just kind of kept marching on through the Cretaceous all the way to the bitter end uh, as the meteor impacted at the end of the Cretaceous. That was really kind of the dinosaur heyday, although there's some evidence they may have already been in decline. Talk about that a little bit later in the course, but um, so these are all the different dinosaur forms. Just look how different they are. Superficially, like, what is it exactly that defines what a dinosaur is? Well, we already talked about all those features. Uh, those are all skeletal. When you're looking at these living forms like this, it's really hard to see that. It's really difficult to see that stuff. It's really kind of hard to see how these giant sauropod dinosaurs uh, and these little theropod dinosaurs, how they're uh, kind of related to each other. How are these the same thing? They're not even really all that close. Uh, but again, we talk about them all as dinosaurs because they have those kind of like, at least most of those five criteria that make a dinosaur. So let's take all these different body plans and let's start classifying them. So here's some dinosaur toys. So you go to the toy store, Toys R Us. Is that still a thing? I haven't seen a Toys R Us around in a while. Did they go out of business? Uh, but anyways, uh, you go find some toys uh, you can see here in this toy set that uh, initially early on, uh, dinosaurs were kind of viewed as more slow and scaly and reptilian and more plotting. And, and these toys kind of still represent that. This is kind of like an older view of dinosaurs. Uh, these are a little bit more dynamic. Uh, and so are these. Uh, these probably fit a little bit better with our modern view of dinosaurs. Uh, one thing you're not seeing, you're not seeing the feathers, which we'll talk about a little bit. but 
Uh, at least some dinosaurs were feathered. Possibly all dinosaurs were feathered. Definitely not no dinosaurs were feathered. So the pendulums kind of swung back and forth between initially no dinosaurs are feathered to maybe all dinosaurs are feathered. The truth is probably somewhere in between. But here's a bunch of different toys. They have a bunch of different characteristics uh, representing a lot of the same animals. But let's say that I handed all of these to you and I told you, put these things in groups. So how would you group these toys? How would you group these organisms together? Uh, what characteristics would you use? And do you think everyone would make the same groups? And uh, if you think they wouldn't, uh, how would you convince someone that your grouping was correct? So how would you know that you did it the right way? So you'd be like, what did you do over here? You, you did it wrong. That's not the right way to group these. Look at my grouping here. It's much better. Uh, how would you know that you're right? Well, first of all, we got to get rid of all the non-dinosaurs. So uh, Demetrodon, not a dinosaur. Demetrodon's not even Mesozoic. Remember, it was around in the Permian. Uh, woolly mammoth, not a dinosaur. Uh, not even Mesozoic. Ichthyosaur, uh, sorry, no, that's a, that's a please, uh, Pliosaur, looks like with the shorter neck. Um, not, not, a, not a dinosaur. Actually, that's probably a Mosasaur with the tail there. Uh, pterosaur, not a dinosaur. Uh, look at all these dinosaurs. What characteristics are we going to use? And how do you know you did it right? Well, uh, let's say that you did that. Everyone's going to come up with a different answer. Uh, the criteria that we settled on and the cladogram that we've mostly been using uh, since very early on is that you split the dinosaurs into two orders, two big orders, the Sauritia, the quote unquote lizard hip. So Sauritia means lizard hipped dinosaurs. And they kind of have this characteristic S neck. And they have this hip structure with the pubis uh, facing forwards. So the pubis is facing forwards here. Uh, the ornithischian dinosaurs are the other, and so we got Saurischians over here. These are the Saurischian dinosaurs. These are the ornithischian dinosaurs. The pubis is rotated backwards, uh, and they also have this uh, predentary uh, beak. So it's a bone at, at the front of the lower jaw. Uh, when they were alive, they had like a kind of a beak over it. Um, but these are the bird-hipped dinosaurs. Uh, because they have a hip structure very similar to modern birds with the pubis uh, back, facing backwards. So clearly birds are bird-hipped ornithischian dinosaurs. So here's the split here. Ornithischians are everything over here. Okay, where's birds, 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 birds? Oh, that's weird. I don't see birds. Uh, what? Uh, birds are over here. Uh, birds are saurish and lizard-hipped dinosaurs. So this is sort of unfortunate. Uh, a term. So initially, uh, birds were thought to be more closely related with the ornithischians. And so that's actually how they named the group because they looked so much like birds. Uh, they also have the beak like birds. And so you'd be obviously forgiven for making that assumption. But uh, birds are actually on the Sauritian uh, line. They're, they're theropod dinosaurs. They're of the theropod clad. Uh, so let's take a closer look at this. So uh, Sauritia versus Ornithischia, sometimes Saurischia versus Ornithischia, sometimes the sk is hard. I'm not sure exactly which one's right, but sh sounds better to me. <clears throat> uh, so dinosaur hip structures. So again, Saurischian, lizard hipped, the pubis points forward. Ornithischian, bird hipped, the pubis points backwards with the ixium. Uh, and again, uh, if you look at a pigeon skeleton, the pubis points backwards. But uh, so birds are not bird hip dinosaurs. Uh, well, but but they're not. So they they share the same characteristic, but they're actually saurischians. So how is that possible? Well, uh, the pubis in birds later rotated to be convergent evolution with the ornithischian. So uh, it was modified later on. So they evolved initially the earliest birds. So like Archaeopteryx, they still have the Saurischian hip. Uh, later, the pubis rotates backwards. So why 
uh, we can't really know, but likely it's to make room for air sacs that make birds breathing really efficient so they can have a really high metabolism to maintain flapping. They're basically making room for air sacs by rotating that pubis backwards. And so it's just kind of coincidental that they end up with a similar hip to the earlier ornithischian bird hip dinosaurs. The ornithischian bird hip dinosaurs have their pubis facing backwards, probably to make room for this big old gut that they need to digest all the plant material that they're eating. So sauritians are mostly carnivores. Uh, it's a lot easier to digest meat uh, than it is some of the very tough vegetation that they're eating. And so sauritians don't need as much room for a gut. They don't need as much room for digestive tract. And so they're able to build themselves a little bit lighter, a little bit lighter on their feet, a little bit more fast, a little bit more agile, a little bit more mobile for catching their prey. Whereas these things are these mobile tanks that are just eating vegetation and they need room to process that vegetation. Again, think about like a cow, a modern cow, a modern elephant. Why are they so big and bulky? They need that room to accommodate all those extra stomachs for digesting all of that pretty difficult to digest food that they eat. So how do we actually group them? So this is, uh, we saw the tree a little bit earlier. This is another tree. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that the ornithischian dinosaurs were on the right-hand side before. Now they're on the left-hand side, but the relationships remain, remain the same. So you can actually spin these trees. It doesn't really matter. So like, for example, here's Sorisha here. Sauropods are on the left, theropods are on the right. Uh, you can easily just spin this because they're at equal branch and it doesn't really matter. It doesn't change the tree. The node stays the same, the branches stay the same. So it doesn't really matter. It's still presented it's still presenting the same information. <laughs> uh, so this is the dinosaur clad cladogram. This is how we've classified dinosaurs since very early on. So it's been in use, this general classification, this split between the Sauritians and the Ornithicians since 1887. So that's a really long time, uh, over 130 years. Uh, it's worked. It's held up to the test of time uh, pretty well. So there's some uh, species, some genre that are a little hard to kind of shoehorn into these categories. Uh, but in general, this classification scheme has mostly worked. We've got the uh, pre-dinosaurs here, dinosaur ancestors here, and then the dinosauria themselves split off into the ornithischian dinosaurs and the saurischian dinosaurs. On the saurischian branch, there's the theropods and the sauropods. On the ornithischian branch, there's the Tyreophoria, the Marginocephalia, and the Ornithopoda. We'll talk about what all those are in just a second. But this is the cladogram that we've been using basically since the beginning of analyzing dinosaurs. As soon as there is enough information, enough specimens to start grouping things together, this has been the way that we've grouped them together. Uh, does that mean that this is the right way to group them together? Well, what does that mean? So uh, generally, the cladogram we're trying to reconstruct a tree that reflects their evolutionary history. And so since there is an actual evolutionary history, there is a right answer. Uh, we don't know that right answer though, because we don't have the luxury of perfect knowledge. We don't know exactly which groups evolved from which groups, which groups descended from which groups, which groups are closely related to each group. So uh, again, these cladograms, these links, these inferred implied evolutionary relationships are hypotheses. This cladogram is a hypothesis. This is a educated guess. Uh, again, guess is a bad word. It's a smart guess. <laughs> um, and it's stood up to testing for 130 plus years and it's worked pretty well. Uh, there are some issues with it. There are some pros and cons to it, but it works pretty well and people have been using it and we're comfortable with it. And the course is actually structured with this structure in mind. However, uh, very recently uh, in 2017, uh, there was kind of this big hoopla uh, where uh, Barron, who was a grad student at Cambridge and some of his advisors, uh, they took a look at the tree and they actually resorted it. <gasps> Blasphemy. So the tree that we've been using for 130 plus years, uh, they reshaped it. So now, Dinosauria, 
splits off into sauropods as like their own group. Uh, and then there's the ornithoskeleta, the bird-legged dinosaurs. And that's the theropods are the first group that kind of branch off there. And then the ornithicians, all the ornithicians are a different arm of that. And so it basically puts the theropods and the sauropods uh, no longer linked under the Saurischian umbrella. They're now separate. Uh, the ornithicians remain mostly unchanged, uh, but this the key difference is, is they've separated these out. Uh, so basically the, the idea here was that uh, sauropods and theropods are, are pretty radically different from each other. Uh, one's bipedal, one's quadrupedal, one is a car mostly carnivorous, one is almost entirely, if not entirely, herbivorous. Very, very different structures, very different lifestyles. Uh, they're pretty different from each other, so it makes a little bit of sense to have them on different branches, and, and this is what was proposed. And uh, I wasn't at any of the meetings or anything like that when this was being discussed, so I'm not exactly sure how it went over, but based on what I've read, uh, it didn't go over very well. Uh, scientists are pretty entrenched in their positions, and this has 130 years of people's careers linked to it, all their studies using the previous cladogram. Uh, I built my syllabus based on the previous cladogram, so I'm attached to it a little bit as well. Uh, it, this can be a little bit problematic and, and it can cause some friction uh, in the scientific community and it did and there's still pushback and uh, this tree has not yet been adopted as the tree to go forward with um, but it's still being talked about it's still being discussed it's still being evaluated so uh, it brings us to just kind of a little segue here of like how does science actually work so one of the things I'd like you to get out of this course, since it's a natural science gen ed, uh, it might be the only science class that you take in your undergrad career, uh, I want you to kind of come away with an idea of how science works and kind of bust some of the myths associated with it. So uh, there's this famous quote from Isaac Newton, or at least attributed to Isaac Newton, that uh, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And so this is kind of how science should work is that every generation builds on the generation before, and we just keep getting better and better and better and improving step by step by step, always towards a constant better version of the truth in a very linear and progressive fashion with no fits and starts, and it's just constant ever flowing towards the best. And that's not really how it works. So a more pessimistic view, a more cynical view, more really nihilistic view, is that uh, progress happens one, uh, it was, the original quote is one funeral at a time, but let's say one retirement at a time. Uh, progress happens one retirement at a time. Uh, or to say it another way, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing opponents and making them see the light, but rather because his opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. So uh, again, the original dinosaur cladogram has 130 years of research behind it, it's firmly entrenched with the researchers that uh, went to grad school using that model, that did all of their research, built their careers on using that model, using that cladogram. Uh, the new cladogram may in fact be better, that remains to be seen, but it's gonna be very difficult to convince the people that have been using the other scheme for their entire careers that it is better and that they should change. So we like to kind of put science up on like a pedestal that it's like uh, completely objective, opinions don't get involved, feelings don't get involved, personalities don't get involved, uh, but it's not true. Uh, science is a process and it's done by people. People are people, people have flaws. Scientists are not cold, illogical beings. They're not Vulcans operating only on logic. Uh, their scientists get jealous of each other. Scientists, uh, have feuds with each other. There are arguments, there are disagreements. Uh, we'll talk about some of the major disagreements actually uh, coming up pretty soon here, but uh, as much as we'd like to think that it's a nice progressive, straight, clean, easy, linear process towards a better truth, it often doesn't work that way. Uh, and so uh, if we look at this, um, this is some data here and uh, the bottom is time to or after death. And it's basically a number of papers on this axis in that field. And so um, 
there's kind of like a rate at which papers are produced during a like star scientist's lifetime. And that pretty much maintains. Um, what we would kind of think would happen is that after a star scientist dies or retires and moves on to something else, that the field kind of suffers and we've lost their experience. Uh, and so th it the papers should decline. Uh, what we actually see is that in that particular field, the number of papers actually increases. Uh, the papers from their collaborators, so the people that were closely tied to that star scientist, uh, they do drop off, but non-collaborators radically increases enough to offset that. Uh, and so rather than standing on the shoulders of giants, uh, in many ways, we stand under the feet of giants. Um, charismatic, powerful scientists dominate their fields and for better or worse, uh, they make a lot of contributions to that field, but they can also lead to stagnation. And once they're out of the way, it opens opportunities for other people. Uh, and so we kind of unfortunately see this kind of fits and starts. So there's kind of like this inertia of change. So uh, if you've ever dealt with any kind of business models or like uptake of technology, there's this concept of inertia of change. So that's, uh, there's a new disruptive thing a new technology like you know smartphones, for example. Uh, there's this process when the thing first starts coming out and there's this curve of how people respond. Uh, so there's the innovators, there are the people that really wanna, uh, that are actually like pushing this development. And they're like, this is the best thing ever. We should all do it. It's amazing, do it now. Uh, there's the early adopters that very quickly get on board and they're like, wow, this thing's really neat. I definitely need this. Those people are super smart. I, I don't know how I lived without this. I'm definitely getting it. Uh, then there's this kind of chasm, a big split. And there's kind of the fence sitters, the uh, early majority who eventually adopt it, but they kind of sit on the fence for a while, like just like, hmm, do I really want the smartphone in my pocket? Like, do I, is being connected to the internet all the time really something that I need. Uh, I got by with my flip phone just fine for uh, quite a while. Why do I need this new thing? But it is pretty intriguing though. Uh, and then there's kind of the late majority that they'll eventually sign up. You know, what are what are these weirdos up to? Um, eventually everyone's walking around or most people are walking around with smartphones and be like, wow, I mean, that's just something that, that's cool, I guess. Uh, I'm, I'm finally on board, I, I guess I should. Everyone else has one, I guess I should go get one too. Uh, and then there's the laggards that are just never going to adopt it. And there, this one's sad here, I want my fax machine back. Uh, so there's this inertia of change and adoption of technology. There's also the similar inertia with adoption of new scientific ideas. And sometimes it takes retirements, but uh, just like uh, throughout time, the, the arrow of time bends towards justice. Uh, in theory, the arrow of time bends towards improved research. And so that's kind of how the progress, the process of science that eventually the evidence is going to become overwhelming. Eventually the evidence is gonna mount enough that it's able to overcome this inertia of change. Uh, if we continue to find evidence that supports that new tree for the dinosaur families in like a decade or so, there's probably going to be enough momentum to kind of push that forward. Uh, right now, people are kind of like, probably here, like, um, hmm, I mean, that's interesting in many ways, but uh, I still kind of like my flip phone, so I'm not really ready to make that jump yet. Uh, so that's kind of a tangent, sorry about that, but I just want you to know that, so science is a process done by people, and the people have all of the strengths and flaws of people. Scientists are not called illogical robots. Um, there's a third cladogram. So, oh my gosh. So there was the original cladogram all the way back to 1887. The new cladogram proposed in 2017. Uh, this one was proposed in 1986 by uh, Bob Baker uh, in his revolutionary book, The Dinosaur Heresies. Uh, this was another like radical disruptive idea. Uh, it actually led to a lot of the modern ideas of dinosaurs as potentially warm-blooded, uh, not the slow plotting reptiles, but active, energetic, highly metabolic, uh, very engaged critters. 
Uh, and so in many ways, the dinosaur heresy has shaped a lot of our modern views of dinosaurs, but uh, this tree didn't really catch on. Uh, so his d definition here was the uh, phytodinosauria model where he lumped up all the plant eating dinosaurs. So think back to the last lecture, or I guess two lectures ago, the phytosaurs, the plant crocodile, or I guess phytos, yeah, the plant lizards, like they didn't actually eat plants, but uh, phytodinosauria, the plant dinosaurs. So again, here's dinosauria. There's a split. The theropods are off on their own branch, the carnivorous bipedal theropods that eventually give rise to the bird line. Uh, they're off on their own branch. And then all of the herbivorous dinosaurs are over here on a big branch. The sauropods branch off early, and then all the other ornithischians branch off. Again, you see that the ornithischians themselves are relatively uh, same structure as before, uh, but now the sauropodomorphs are lumped in with them and the theropods are separated out. Uh, so uh, the idea here, so which one's right? So this can be very frustrating because this is a class and ultimately there's a right answer. Uh, I'm not going to test you on this because we don't know uh, which one's correct. We, we just don't know. Uh, I'm using the cladogram to structure the order that we're talking about these things in, but we don't know the correct tree here. Again, the intent of cladograms is to accurately reflect the evolutionary phylogeny, the evolutionary history of the group. So when you make a cladogram, you're making a hypothesis about how the group evolved and how these things are related to each other evolutionarily. Uh, we don't have the luxury of knowing the truth, and we may never know the truth. Ideally, we'll slowly get better over time with those fits and starts as people sl are slow to adopt new disruptive ideas. Uh, but all of the models have some supporting evidence or they wouldn't exist. Uh, these are very smart people that made these models. Uh, they had their reasons. There are pros and cons to all of the different models. The right cladogram is the one that's most useful. Uh, my personal opinion is that the traditional view is still the most useful, uh, but I can see some benefits to both of the other models. Uh, and really, like we'll, we'll get there eventually. Uh, if the evidence becomes overwhelming in support of this model, we'll probably end up switching to it. Uh, not during the course of this class, it's going to be like a decades long struggle. Uh, but this hypothesis from like the 80s, it's, uh, that's, it's been around for quite a while. If this was going to get adopted, it probably would have been adopted by now. But I guess never say never. Um, but this is the one we're going to go with. So uh, we're going to use the old cladogram. This is how the course is structured. Uh, we're going to talk about the dinosauria as a whole. We're going to talk about saurischians first. We're going to talk about theropods, sauropods. That's the next module. Uh, then the next module after that is the ornithischians. We're going to talk about the armored dinosaurs, the margin of cephalia, and then the bird foot dinosaurs. So we're going to talk about that in this order, and that's all that it matters. We're just going to use it for the order that we're going to talk about it in. Uh, so I'm just going to give a little brief overview of all of these groups. So uh, on the tree, the theropods, the saurischian theropods, theropod means beast footed. Uh, they're mostly carnivorous bipeds. Uh, they're the majority of the carnivorous dinosaurs. So uh, if you think about a meat-eating dinosaur, it's almost certainly a theropod. There are some exceptions. There are definitely uh, some examples of carni carnivorous uh, other dinosaurs, very few and far between. But uh, so there's a lot of different groups of theropod. They're, they're very highly varied. So uh, includes things like the Spinosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, Archaeopteryx, uh, and then of course the fearsome pigeon. So again, pigeons are dinosaurs. Birds are dinosaurs. Birds branch off this theropod lineage. Birds are modern dinosaurs. The dinosaurs are not extinct. The non-avian dinosaurs are. So all the non-bird dinosaurs are extinct, uh, but birds are not. And pigeons kind of carry on their legacy here. Uh, this woman is probably going to be dead very soon. <laughs> I hope not, but, um, but again, saurischian, theropods, beast-footed, theropoda, beast-foot. Uh, sauropodomorph means lizard-footed form. Uh, so these, this other group on the saurischian, lizard-hipped tree. So there's the prosauropods. Uh, these are kind of the earlier 
sauropods. Uh, a lot of these are bipedal because again, the ancestor, the earlier ancestor was probably bipedal. Um, and then later on, they evolved towards the sauropod group, uh, which are the quadrupedal uh, herbivores uh, that just grew to colossal insane size. They're the largest, the largest land animals ever. Uh, there's been some studies that suggest that they reached the limit of a tetrapod form. A four-footed land-dwelling creature could not get larger than they did. That's just not physically possible. Now that's obviously up for debate, but um, it's not impossible for an organism to get bigger than that, uh, but you would need an entirely different body plan, uh, something totally different than the tetrapod body form that we all inherited from when Tiktaalik crawled out of the ocean. Uh, all of the land-based vertebrates, besides for the arthropods, for the insects, arthropods and arachnids, uh, have that tetrapod heritage. And so we're restricted to that body form and this was probably the max. And so um, one thing that I was very sad when to, to find out, uh, I don't know, like 10-ish years ago or something like that was, uh, Brontosaurus is a very popular dinosaur and Brontosaurus is actually an invalid name or at least it was. So Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus are very close to each other. They're very hard to tell apart. And for about a hundred years, uh, very early on in, in like the early 1900s, uh, it was recognized that Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus are the same thing. And Apatosaurus was named first. And so Apatosaurus gets priority. Apatosaurus is the name and Brontosaurus should be discarded and never used. Uh, for some reason uh, in pop culture, Brontosaurus was the word that ended up actually being used. And so we generally grew up knowing what a Brontosaurus was, or at least I did. Uh, and then later on, you had to have the painful discussion that, well, Brontosaurus isn't actually a thing. It's actually a Patosaurus. Um, but that's not true anymore. So Brontosaurus is back. Uh, there's enough differences between Brontosaurus specimens and Apatosaurus specimens that now it's believed that they are two separate things. And so Brontosaurus is a valid dinosaur name. So hooray, every one of people's favorite dinosaurs is back. Uh, when we're talking about seropods, it's impossible to talk about them without talking about just how truly colossally large they are. Again, the biggest thing ever to walk on land. The blue whale is still the biggest, the largest organism now and probably ever, almost certainly ever. There's no evidence of anything even remotely close to as big. Um, but how do you define largest? So let's think about that for a second. Um, Argentinosaurus is, in my opinion, the largest dinosaur, but there's a lot of other candidates. So uh, you'll often see Dreadnoughtus listed as the largest dinosaur or Patagotitan, or if you wanna talk about length, uh, diplo Diplodocids with their really long whip-like tails, uh, they're longer than some of the bigger dinosaurs. Uh, is length the way to measure how big a dinosaur is? Is height how to measure the largest dinosaur? Is mass how to measure the largest dinosaur? There's different answers to all of those questions. Uh, so asking which dinosaur is the largest is uh, actually a sort of complicated question. What do you mean by largest? Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that uh, a lot of these dinosaurs, we only have very scattered remains. The remnants of Argen Argentinosaurus, there's a lot more Argentinosaurus specimens than there are for Dreadnoughtus. Dreadnoughtus's body size has a lot more error on it because there's a lot less material to make good estimates. And so uh, the higher end of the Dreadnoughtus uh, estimates is definitely a very large animal, larger than Argentinosaurus, but we have a little bit better constraint on Argentinosaurus. So uh, there you go. So that's the sauropods. Now we're gonna go over to the ornithischian side so now we're over on this branch. The first branch here that we're gonna talk about is uh, the Tyreophora. So that translates to shield bearers, and I think you can see why. So again, these are mostly herbivorous. There is one example, at least one example of a probably carnivorous ankylosaurid, uh, but they're mostly herbivorous. Uh, they're armored with these scoots, these armored scoots, uh, or in some cases, plates. Uh, they have, in some cases, tail spikes. Not all of these have tail spikes. Not all stegosaurids have tail spikes. 
uh, and some have these big tail clubs. So kind of the difference between a nodosaur and ankylosaur is ankylosaurs have the tail club and nodosaurs don't. Uh, otherwise, they're very similar to each other. Uh, but they're built very heavily. They sort of loosely resemble an elephant or a cow in body shape just because they have the massive uh, abdomen for accommodating a massive stomach for digesting very difficult to digest plant material. Uh, if you look at the head though, the head is almost sort of funnily small for how big the animal is. And so they had relatively small brains for their body size. Uh, I guess eat plants and swing tail at things isn't all that hard of a job to process. So they didn't need big brains. They, their lifestyle is relatively simple. Eat, 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 defend yourself and reproduce. So there it is. Uh, so that's the Tyreophora. We'll spend two days on those talking about the Stegosauria and the Ankylosauria, including the Notosaurs. Uh, and then we're going to talk about marginocephalia. So uh, these are kind of into two different groups, which we'll spend a day on each of them. Uh, the pachycephalosaurs with their thick-headed, um, marginocephalia means margin-headed, so some ornamentation around the side of the head, uh, which are, you know, you see the kind of almost like monk skull cap kind of thing looking here. Um, the frill of triceratops, and then styracosaur with its incredibly ornate frill, but uh, the two groups, the pachycephalosaurs, uh, a lot of debate about what this thick bony skull was actually for. Uh, there is initially was like, you know, rams come and smash their horns together. Uh, I saw one study that said that if they actually did that, their skulls would crack. So they probably used it more for like just kind of butting and jousting, kind of more like maybe like deer or something like that, where there's kind of rubbing and butting versus actually full on like boom. Um, and then there's the triceratops. Everybody's kind of one of their favorites uh, with the frill here and the three horns, triceratops, three horn face. Uh, and then styracosaur here, um, the ceratopsians could get pretty crazy with their frills. Uh, again, the color here is kind of speculative, but remember that uh, birds are dinosaurs, not on this line, they're on the theropod line, but birds are dinosaurs. Uh, they're the closest living relative dinosaurs. Uh, birds are very ornate. There's a lot of colorful birds. There's a lot of sexual display in birds and they use color and they're very visual creatures. Dinosaurs are similarly structured where they have the sclerotic ring, they're visual creatures. Uh, color was probably important to them. Color is not very well preserved though. So this coloration here, is pretty speculative. Uh, you'll often see a lot of paleo art for Styracosaur that's like very vibrantly colored. I guess if you've got such a crazy canvas like this giant frill here, uh, there's just too much temptation to, to paint it some crazy colors. And we can't say whether that's true or not. It's not preserved yet that we've seen. Uh, sometimes in exceptional preservation cases like that Notosaur mummy, uh, we can see skin pigment enough to see that it was counter shaded. Uh, but we probably will never know exactly what color these things were. And so we have to take artistic liberties. And so oh, looks pretty cool. Looks fine to me. Uh, and then the last group, the ornithopods. Uh, so these are the bird footed dinosaurs. And just remember that bird footed dinosaurs, uh, you would think, OK, well, ornithicians, bird hipped dinosaurs, ornithopod, bird foot dinosaurs. Clearly the birds are on this line. They're not. So it's very confusing. It's very annoying. It is what it is. You're going to have to remember that. Uh, the birds are on the theropod line, or at least that's our best guess. There's a lot of good evidence for that. That's almost certain, I would say. Uh, these ornithopods are uh, mostly bipedal herbivores, uh, and they have very efficient chewing teeth and massive guts. Uh, they're so good at what they do that towards the end of the Mesozoic, coming near to the extinction, uh, by that point, these smaller ornithopods had outcompeted the larger sauropods. And so we kind of stopped seeing those incredibly large, uh, you know, Brontosaurus, Apatosaurus, Argentinosaurus. Those forms sort of get outcompeted by these smaller, but still massive, uh, 
duckbill hadrosaurs. Uh, so uh, this is an iguanodon here, uh, duckbill hadrosaur here. Um, so that's, uh, you can see why they would call it bird foot, kind of looks like an ostrich foot with the three toes. If you go see the geese footprints in the snow around Oswego, you'll see a footprint that would look very similar to this with the three toes. Uh, and of course, there are piles of leavings, uh, which we'll talk about actually in a couple of classes, what we can learn from that. Uh, so that's all the different dinosaur clads. That's how we're going to structure the class. That's all I've got for today. Hope you enjoyed it again. Hope you're keeping up and goodbye.